Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Bill, I have a bone to pick with you. Yes, sir. Uh, you have got, you have wasted, well, <laughs> wasted is the wrong word, but hours of my life in the past week listening to this podcast called Cocaine and Rhinestone. That, isn't that the best podcast? <laughs> I'm now addicted to this. <laughs> How far have you got? And, and what I liked is the email you sent me where you knew I wasn't going to listen to it. Like, and you're like, no, you're like, no, really, you should, you need to listen to it. And I'm like, okay, I guess I really, because I would have just ignored it had you not gone to that extra, no, really, you have to, uh, it's great, man. So this is, this is a podcast by Tyler Mahan Co., who is the son of uh, legendary slash infamous outlaw country star David Allen Co. Uh, you might know David Allen Co. for being, um, uh, having put out these just blatantly racist underground CDs. Uh, in the well, he also 80s. had the huge hit, You Never Call Me By My Name, yeah. or whatever. He also wrote, Take that, This Job and Shove It. No, nah, well, I think Johnny... Jay I think Paycheck he, sang it, but I thought he yeah. co-wrote it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and by the way, Johnny Paycheck, wildly underrated as well. <laughs> I'm serious. Are you, you a fan know, of the movie, Take This Job and Shove It? I was not aware that <laughs> such a thing existed. <laughs> Um, so Tyler clearly has a more liberal bent, but that's really, that's not the point. That's not the point of the show. Uh, the point is he is doing um, backstories on uh, not so well known, or sometimes sometimes more well known country stars, country songwriters. Sometimes they're just about a single song. He's got a three episode arc just on Harper Valley PTA. Uh, <laughs> there are stories about you know grisly murders and yeah. uh, it's and, really a blend of, of, of history and politics and the his, history of America and the history of American music and traditional music and some of its Cajun, some of its uh, folk and it, 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 it's very it, it'll it'll teach you a lot. Um, it, it, and it's a very like highly produced podcast. This isn't just a conversation. It's it's it must have taken him so much time and energy to to do the research and editing to put so this he, together. He, he ties in a lot of threads in every episode. Yeah. There's a not only is there a ton of research in every episode. He ends every episode with liner notes where he goes through his sources and explains why he chose this source and not that source, and why there's debates about these different points, and why he thought this was the true story and not that the true story. Uh, it's just exceptionally well done. Uh, My concern is he has a very weird, like, cadence, like yeah. a very unusual way of talking. Um, and I'm afraid I'm going to pick up on it and I'm going to start <laughs> talking like him. I mean, maybe I'm doing it now. It's weird. Like, I, I don't want it to get in my head and change the way that I – I don't want to do, like, do an impersonation of him. So I'm going to have to, like, tone down listening to that podcast for a little while. So even if you don't care for country music, like, because it's – cause it's, it's also it's about the, the history of mid-century twenty of uh, yeah. twenty-century America, uh, and the political elements of it. You're going to be interested in, uh, and how the music affected society at the time. You're going to be interested in. You, you, you're just going to like it. Period. Yeah, and even like the one episode I thought I was going to hate it was about Winona. You know, like Winona Judd. Oh, so you got you got ahead of me. I'm only I'm only up to Tom T. Hall. All right, you're going in order. I'm oh skipping. yes, I am going in order. I'm skipping around. I'm just like, but I thought like the Winona episode, like you know, why? What am I gonna like like about Winona? And uh, without being too much of a spoiler, it gets into this fascinating question about how she had this big hit that was not country at all. It didn't sound like country, but it was a big hit. And then after that, she reverts to more classically country music, and she never has another big hit again. He's, and very, then it, he's very interested in hits. Yeah. You know, because it, it's, it's not really like trying to find like these like super obscure people who, ne who never broke it big. Like he, it's it's a partly about how the business works, how the industry of country music and the music industry in general works. And so the the the, the drive for hits is definitely a theme, I think, throughout yeah. the whole series. The, the Buck Owens one I loved. Have you gotten to the Buck Owens one yet? I have not gotten to that one yet. I think that's the next um, one after Tom T. Hall. I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but that's a it's actually a two part uh, two episodes on Buck Owens and the Bakersfield sound, and and he goes into explaining the story of so in the in the 90s probably maybe the 80s late 80s early 90s um, Dwight Yoakam had this hit called The Streets of Bakersfield, 
in Bakersfield, California, there was a whole sound out there. I mean, Bill, I know you wrote your thesis on this, so <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this for the benefit, the benefit of the audience who may not be uh, as sophisticated as we are. Um, so the Nash Nashville is the the home of country music and and sort of the capital, but it's also known to be like highly produced and a little bit too poppy. And so there's like a Texas scene and there's a Bakersfield, California scene. That's where Buck Owens from. That's where Merle Haggard's from. Uh, well, actually, uh, a lot of them sort of some people moved out there. It's sort of like Eddie Vedder wasn't from Seattle. But, you know, anyway, that's the scene. There was a Bakersfield sound. And um, and this podcast does the backstory of the song, The Streets of Bakersfield, which I never knew. And it's actually a very interesting, I, I thought, story. So check it out. So now that we've podcasted about someone else's podcast, we meta. should we should do our really own podcast. Meta. Really meta here, but I think we should pay it forward, right? <laughs> I mean, I, maybe other people should be talking about this show. If Why not? If anyone out there with your own podcast, you're welcome. We're talking about our podcast yeah. and your podcast, <laughs> and maybe then we'll talk about your podcast. Yes, um, it's the weekend podcast. Now, I don't know about you, Matt. When I was in college, I have a vague memory of Dinesh D'Souza coming to Oberlin to give a speech. Uh, I didn't. I didn't go to it. I, I didn't know who he was. Yeah, uh, Michelle Malkin uh, protested him being too right wing. It's, it's possible that she recruited him. I don't really remember. <laughs> uh, but I remember him being sold as this real conservative intellectual talking about. Uh, I, I think I think I think campus intellectualism. Uh, and I just didn't care enough to you know go go see him. Um, and he, his career since then has been uh, uh, I think less highbrow than his his backers initially intended. Yet he's still here. He's he, uh, despite being in jail for a period of time, he puts out these conspiratorial documentaries that do very well uh, i believe i believe your mother was a fan of one of them if i remember correctly uh yeah that that documentary she went to see it at the theaters i think one of her sisters uh one of her fox news watching sisters took her and um that i think that's what persuaded my mom to vote for trump she was she was uh i think going to sit the election out and she went to see that and then i tweeted about it like in a way that was not terribly flattering to Dinesh. It was like, I forget what I said, but he actually took pride in this and, and, and retweeted it about how his movie is the reason my mom voted. Well, it, it, it really made a big, it, it actually had a big impact. I'll say that. And so it seems that uh, yeah. Trump has returned the favor. Yeah. Uh, and let me just say, uh, you know, I love my mom. Uh, she's awesome and a great person. Um, but we disagreed over that, <laughs> over that. Uh, vote. So uh, why do you think of, of all the people in the world? I mean, there, there, there are plenty of conservatives out there to do favors for. Um, why did Trump pick D'Souza? Um, how has the right uh, reacted to this pardon? And, uh, and, and what's your, I mean, beyond the, the movies, what's your sense of D'Souza as a person as a, and, and his role in the conservative movement? Oh, yeah, a lot to chew on there. So first I heard him, the first time I heard him was uh, when I, uh, I was interning at the Leadership Institute in the late 90s, and he was speaking some, I think he had a book out, and he was speaking somewhere, it was like one of these places like Irish Times or the Hawk and Dove, like in their basement, somewhere like that. Um, and we went and I remember a liberal infiltrator asked, tried to like ask him a, a rude sort of mean, uh, gotcha question. And a guy I was there with my friend, Dave, um, started like getting into a fight with this liberal. And then Dinesh was like, no, no, you know, calmed it down and was like, I thank you for coming. I, you know, I appreciate you being here and let him, let him talk and sort of played that. And then answered the question and kind of won, really won the crowd over even more by encouraging uh, this. So that my first impression of him was very positive. Um, then I remember he had a book about Reagan that that was very popular with conservatives. I think he had a book that was like um, uh, a letter letter to a young conservative, something like that. So this was a guy who I mean, 
we need more conservative intellectuals. And I think he he had the uh, the the Ivy League Dartmouth, you know, resume. Um, now I remember I actually I did see him speak once, and it was at the 2007 CPAC, and he was debating Robert Spencer about Islam. Because Spencer wrote like you know like Islam for Dummies or something or other like the conservative the politically ignorant guide to Islam or something where it's basically Islam is fundamentally horrible and we should all hate Islam, and D'Souza had a book out about how the cultural left is to blame for nine yeah. eleven, and we should be um, building bridges to traditional Islam to fight against the cultural left. We want to drive a wedge. Between radical Islam, we don't want to be in line with terrorists, but we don't want to lump them all into the same bucket because the cultural left is the common enemy here that we share with traditional Islam. And they, I think it's one of the few panels at CPAC where there's actual disagreements being aired because everything else at CPAC is just constant drumming, talking points. Well, I mean, that, that was like a valid argument before 9-11. And I think that's but what Grover Norquist... This was six years after. Right. I think that Grover Norquist before 9-11 was trying to kind of make that same argument. Yeah. And 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 you could have you could have, you know, it, it, things could have turned out very differently, and and you could have had um, Muslims being a natural coalition in the conservative movement against secularization and you know sort of liberal values and um, anyway it but did for, not. But for D'Souza to take that stance in two thousand seven. Would, yeah. I would. I don't want to paint a broad brush and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think he would be in the minority yeah. of the conservative was, base making that case. I don't think it went over well. I don't think it worked. Um, I, I think it was really panned. Um, I don't remember anybody agreeing with him. Maybe Ann Coulter. I don't. She probably would have hated it too at the time. I don't even know. And so, how does he go from there to being, you know, Trump's favorite? So. Okay, so I think there's a couple things. Um, I had uh, John Podhoritz on my podcast yesterday to talk to talk about this uh, and get his perspective. John argues that Dinesh tried to be an intellectual and have a career that way and that it didn't work. And so he reverted to it was easier to be a troll, um, which is plausible that there, there certainly could be a financial incentive to I'm, for me I feel like anybody could be a troll what we need are intellectuals and and so it to me it's like an um, a really missed opportunity and we're kind of squandering our resources by having this guy who could have been you know a, a highbrow conservative um, sort of taking the easy way out Right. So let's, let's go back to the country music thing. It would be like, you know, selling out and making um, sort of cheap Nashville hits that, that get a lot of airplay. But they're, they're not, you know, would you rather be like Lucinda Williams, who's like highly regarded and smart? And, and or would you rather be Taylor Swift or something? Um, not that I don't like Taylor Swift. I think she's got some good stuff too. But you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. like the selling out part of it, like for for ratings, for for hits, um, versus keeping it real, authenticity, and and you know that's part of it maybe. Now Dinesh had some weird stuff happen in his life too. Like he was president of King's College, which is I think is like a small Christian school in New York City. He got ousted from that because. I guess he was sharing a room with his fiance before he was official his next fiance before he was officially divorced from his life, something like that. So it didn't comport with their their values. Um, he got fired there. Um, then, of course, there's the Wendy Long thing where he weirdly, you know, got in trouble for campaign finance violations for help trying to help a woman who had no chance of winning a Senate race in New York, which was a very weird thing. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is apparently, I mean, there's reporting that Ted Cruz was the impetus for him getting this pardon, that Ted Cruz is sort of his uh, liaison and his advocate going to Trump trying to get him pardoned. It's just a very weird story. And obviously the common thread here is celebrity, right? So if you're Sylvester Stallone, if you're Kim Kardashian. So, so Stallone advocated for the Jack Johnson pardon. 
the posthumous right. part of the uh, after American boxer. Yeah. So the, Trump is hiring people. If you look at the hires, the Rudy's, the Rudy Giuliani's, the, the Bolton's, the Cudlow's. And if you look at the, the pardons, the Dinesh D'Souza's, the Jack Johnson's and the meeting with Kim Kardashian, you know, Kim Kardashian, it, it, there's definitely a theme here of people. Who, oh, and then there's talk that he may pardon Rod Blagojevich and Martha Stewart. And so part of it is like if you go against if you advocate against the deep state and attack the FBI and or if you're someone who has been on The Apprentice and or if you're famous or have a famous celebrity advocating for you then you have a much better chance of, of getting help from Donald Trump. And I, in the case of D'Souza, well, it's all three of them, D'Souza, Blagojevich, Martha Stewart, there's an additional theme of overzealous prosecution. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that there are people in government that, that do this uh, routinely, and I'm going to protect anybody else in the future who might be victims of overzealous prosecution. Although what, yeah. I, what I don't get about that is if, if you're going to pardon... Manafort, if you're going to pardon Flynn, if you're going to pardon Michael Cohen, why wait? What I mean, these people could be talking now. You want to shut it down now? Well, they might have already talked. They right. might have already had wires and recordings. And yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. You know, I guess the most um, the most concerning theory here is that. Trump is greasing the skids to pardon Manafort and Flynn um, and to send signals to people that they will get pardoned. So don't talk. But I think there's like a less um, malicious or less pernicious version of this that's still concerning, which is like, look, passing legislation is hard, but I can just pardon people. So like last week was, you know, Roseanne Barr week. This week, let's have the media talking about Dinesh D'Souza. Like, it shows well, that yeah, I, he actually signed a law this week. He signed the right the, to trial. The law. right to trial, which I think is fabulous and should be applauded, and people should be talking about it. No one's even talking about it. There, there, um, there, there, there is a counterweight to the argument that it's sort of a puffed up bill that um, it's not really going to get more experimental treatments in the hands of the terminally ill. Um, but but be that as it may, if you signed it, you think you'd want to celebrate your signing of it and draw attention to like, hey, I'm actually doing something here for you. Yeah. No, uh, I, I can't vouch for like the efficacy of the law, but um, this is very like in my wheelhouse and just in terms of the idea. Like, I mean, I guess it's possible that there could be a, a, a medicine that, that you take it and it hurts other people somehow. Um, but generally speaking, if you if you've been given a death sentence and there's some medicine that, you know, has hasn't just hasn't been cleared by the FDA yet, but it could save your life. And these bureaucrats are telling you you can't try. That's you know I like the thing. That's part of the reason I don't like socialized medicine is if there's ever a chance where you can't. I, I want the chance that if I had to rob a bank and get my son, uh, you know, pay for like the best doctor, I would have the chance of doing that. Even the possibility that I could like do that as opposed to everyone being like stuck in this same bureaucratic lane um so this well, this that, is something that's the i principle, like but so the bill says uh you can get access to these drugs without fda approval it doesn't say they have to be covered by insurance it doesn't say you're going to get any help to buy them if the cost is very it's really high uh so how many actual people actually yeah, get their hands on the drugs is is, is still do good question it's it's it, has anyone talked about I, I haven't read much about this have they talked about like the dallas buyers club like impact on this debate i i, I, I don't know i mean it, I, I haven't been steeped in it uh i yeah. do know I, I and i'm not telling you i know more than i do um i read one article uh, pointing out that a bill like this was passed at the state level, I think Colorado, and there wasn't any, well, there wasn't much evidence that people were getting access to drugs they didn't have access to previously. Um, so it's certainly not uh, a slam dunk that all of a sudden there's going to be a sea change here. Um, but, you know, it, it, to the extent that it's an important issue, um, trying something is worth uh, examining, analyzing how did this work. If it didn't work as well as intended, what else can be done as a next yeah. step? Uh, but we're not having that conversation at all because yeah. uh, we're well. The we're, media. I think Trump knows what the media 
likes. And we like talking about Roseanne Barr and we like talking about Dinesh D'Souza and he likes celebrities and it's catnip. So, I mean, I guess there's, I mean, I guess my point is like the worst theory, the, the most, you know, I guess, mali- you know, sort of the, the, the most pernicious theory is that he's setting up pardons for Manafort and Flynn and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's just another theory that he can't do legislation, He, you know, with the exception, obviously, of what we just talked about. But doing legislation is hard. You have to get people to buy in, all that. Um, but what he can do is just pardon people, like whether they deserve it or not, whether it's gone through the proper channels or not, like he can unilaterally do that. There's like really no check on that. And and by doing it, he can drive news cycles. And so you know, that in and of itself is a, a, a disturbing thing. So how beloved is D'Souza in conservative circles? How how much of a political boost does he get uh, among his base for doing this? Or is, or, or is this like kind of an inside baseball thing? I mean, it's probably more inside baseball than outside. But I mean, I think like, you know, if you're, if you're like a... Um, Matt Lewis, Jonah Goldberg, Ben Sass, conservative, then this is not good. But I think if you are, you know, a Sean Hannity, Fox News, Laura Ingram conservative, this is great. And um, it's Donald Trump getting things done, sticking it to the man, um, overturning an Obama thing. Uh, So it's a net positive for Trump. It's very consistent with his whole philosophy, which has always been to, to double down on the base, to, to make his base happy, punish, you know, punish your enemies, reward your friends is, is what's happening here. Um, And and I think also that that's the scary part to me is the uh, look, and there've been Bill Clinton did some horrible uh, pardons, you know, but he sort of did it like on his way out the door. Right. But Bill Clinton made some some very bad pardons. And I, I actually think that Bill Clinton opened up a lot of doors that gave us ultimately Donald Trump, that Bill Clinton broke norms and did things and, and taught us lessons such as the lesson that nobody cares about character or, you know, whatever. Like, but I but I think there's a danger that Trump is kind of taking that to another level and that we could get into it. This is why I was against prosecuting going after Bush people, you know, for war crimes and whatnot. Um, like regardless of the merits, the idea of sort of getting retribution, I, I, I do fear that, that we're setting a precedent here where like presidents are going to be more rewarding friends and more punishing enemies and like where does that lead us where does that spiral to um before i say we're, we're going to talk about uh the roseanne bar and the samantha b stuff uh i know that's not the most important story in the world uh i think it's been pointed out uh many times you know, there's a study about how many people actually died in the puerto rico hurricane that we're not talking about uh, because of this, uh, and that's obviously true. Uh, I think what's difficult about this subject is uh, there's not so much for you and I to say about Puerto Rico. It's horrible yeah. that so many people died, <laughs> and uh, I don't put words in your mouth. I I think it's I think the Trump administration's handling of it has been terrible. Uh, it's certainly a worthy subject of discussion, but I do think that. Uh, there's a tendency to think if I tweet about this issue, I've done some good today. <laughs> and if you're tweeting something else, you're doing something bad today. When the real the question really is, what are the people in government doing about this? I mean, there there's always a ton of issues that are important that aren't going to be part of the national conversation, and we pay public servants to worry about that regardless of what's in the media. Uh, and if there are uh, if there are stories that the media should be telling, they aren't telling, you know, it's on them to find creative ways to tell it. Uh, 
if there are, if Democrats want to make this a bigger issue, it's on them to figure out how to make that uh, compelling to the, the broader public. But uh, it shouldn't require a tweet storm to get the federal government to handle a, a natural disaster properly. Uh, so having said as much, I know you and I don't have too much to add to the subject. We can get into, you know, the well, the, I think it's, re- it's just reinforces the the point where I think Trump does this strategically. I mean, if we're talking about Puerto Rico, he's losing. Um, but it's a bummer to talk about it. I'm not an expert on it. Um, it's depressing. It's sad. Um, but it's, it's a it's bummer probably, to talk about school shootings, but we talk about that more, at least in the wake yeah, of school shootings. But, but we, I think, we will forget about it once it becomes too much of a bummer. Well, but I think, you know, the dirt, the, the, the Don Henley dirty laundry mm-hmm. uh, song where like, you know, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing. I mean, Puerto Rico was probably um, a news story, you know, when it happened. But but now um, it, it's it's just easier to have people talk about Roseanne and show B-roll clips of Roseanne Barr. You're going to get better ratings. You don't have to have anybody like in Puerto Rico. You know what I'm saying? It's just it, it's there's so many reasons why it's there are incentives that would lead us to talk about Roseanne and Dinesh and not to talk about Puerto Rico. And I do think the Roseanne conversation is a relevant one because it's about sure. it's about race in America, which is not and, significant. Now, I, I do think and a lot of things. I, I do think that uh, a lot of the debates about it are uh, what do I want to see on TV? I want to see either, either I want to see Trump people on TV yeah. or I want to see explorations of race on TV. Uh, and let's say again, I mean, this isn't the point, but. I watched the first two episodes of the Roseanne reboot expecting it to be horrible because up until recently re- reboots were bad by and large, you know, we're going to redo, you know, so there were two versions. There was like the, um, you know, return to Mayberry type thing where like you get Andy Griffith and Don Knotts 20 years later and return to Gilligan's fun. Island. You just can't, you just can't go home again, right? It just doesn't work. <laughs> and then there were like the attempted reboots of like the Dukes of Hazard movie or the A Team movie or, you know, uh, uh, Starsky and Hutch movie. No, and those, just, no, the just, Brady Bunch movie is is a classic. That was okay. That was okay. <laughs> um, that one was okay. But but by and large, it doesn't work. And so, but anyway, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought the the two episodes of the Rose and reboot. I mean, the the, the laugh track was weird um, to adjust to, but otherwise. I thought they were like very smart and well done, and uh, so that has nothing to do with Roseanne's personal stuff. But for what it's worth, I thought it was actually pretty good. So, so Roseanne tweets something that is uh, objectively racist, just to her protestations notwithstanding. Uh, it it traffics in uh, the most ludicrous of conspiracy theories, uh, and and she gets fired now. Uh, is this a well, case? There were a couple, right? There was one tweet about Soros and one tweet about Valerie Jarrett. Right. Is that right? I mean, I mean, she had the Chelsea Soros Clinton tweet, but it's the Valerie Jarrett tweet that was okay. the final straw, uh, saying she was m- the Muslim Blutter- Brotherhood plus Plan of the Apes equals right. equals VJ. Um, I know, Matt, you are a, a warrior against political correctness. It's not about warrior, <laughs> weekend warrior. You you didn't like it when um, that guy Google got fired, right? Yeah, um, that's true. So I, I've heard people say, "Why why should uh, why is it when people who do uh, a liberal things uh, like James Damore and Roseanne Barr they get fired?" Yeah, but well, I think uh, a couple. But Joy Reid and uh, I mean Joy Reid's something that wasn't liberal ten years ago, but she's being liberal now. She doesn't. Right, we need to talk about Samantha Joy Reid. Uh, she. She doesn't get fired. Uh, where, where, where do you think the line is being drawn properly here? Well, uh, we, you bring up a whole bunch of things. So here's the problem with Joanne Reed. She claims that she was hacked. She does not admit that she did all, that. She wrote all those things on her blog, fifteen, ten, ten, in some cases like ten years ago. She had this elaborate backstory for some of those things that she was hacked. And I'm open to the possibility that somebody could be hacked. 
it's totally could happen, but it appears to be a lie. Like it doesn't, it lacks verisimilitude. And that's the issue to me, right? And the fact that she is also, here's the other problem. There's the hypocrisy thing where she presents herself and she's on a network that present themselves as being progressive and open-minded and tolerant. And we're all about intersectionality and you know, all that stuff. And then she was, she was doing things um, that go against those values. Um, so to me, her case is very interesting because she like has this theory that she was hacked and hasn't, hasn't, it, hasn't it admitted or apologized for thing, for some of the things. Um, now, the other thing, too, is I, I do want to say I think basically conservatives are against political correctness, but we do believe that a company has the right to fire you. Um, so, you know, I think the problem, again, with Google was they my understanding is that, that they talk about like, hey, man, we're all about ideas. We've got this like this this like venue where you can share your ideas and like we don't judge. Let us, you know, let us know how we can do better. We want to hear from you. And this Google guy wrote something that I thought was very defensible that offended some people um, and he got fired. I think what Roseanne did is not debatable. It was utterly offensive. And racist. So I don't think there's a gray area. I, so for me, well, it, should, it's, it's should someone be fired for expressing controversial slash uh, slash offensive opinions out of the workplace? Oh, good question. So this this is an interesting uh, caveat you put at the end, right? Because um, the NFL, for example, they're policing on the field behavior. Right. So it's different. Roseanne on, on is, the job behavior. Right. Um, but in the case of Roseanne, her show was not racist. She was not well, going there, on. There, there's some debate about that. OK, well, I saw the two episodes. OK, um, but but the, the, the problem, what got her fired was not anything she said on ABC. It was a tweet. But look, I think that her tweets do reflect ABC. Um, and I think it's perfectly f uh, fair and legitimate that they fired her. Yeah. I mean, but then can't Google say, we don't want James Damore. Uh, sure they say, can. Who's saying that women are, are, are genetically not as good at coding yeah. as men. We don't want well, that I don't know that he the Google said brand. that exactly. I think that anyway, mm -hmm. I think it was more, much more nuanced than that, but that was how it was interpreted. And look, he wrote this like, incredibly long manifesto a year ago. So I'm not, you know, saying I'm an expert on him and he might have, there may be other things about him that I don't want to defend. But um, to me, it's a matter of degrees. Okay, Google does have the right to fire him and they did. And I think what I always said was they shouldn't. They shouldn't um, because they had presented this, hey, just tell us what you think kind of philosophy and what he had written, I think he really went out of his way to try to couch it in, you know, ironic terms. And the same thing is true with Roseanne, which so, is so to say, I think, I think, I think CBS has the right to fire her, but should they? Yes. Well, and then I ask you, so we all agree, I think you and I both agree, private companies have the right to fire people, you know, so long as it doesn't violate, you know, any kind of contract that was, was set. Uh, but on the should or shouldn't question, where do you stand on... Yes. James Damore, Roseanne Barr, Colin Kaepernick, jo Joanne Reed, Sam B. Okay, so let's go through the list. Number one, the guy from Google, I think that firing him was a matter of political correctness and they should not have done it. Roseanne was overtly racist and they should have fired her and they did. Samantha B., um, I, don't think, I don't think I would fire her, actually. I'm not sure I can express why. But um, she was mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but she wasn't. And you could say that she used a misogynistic term, although I think in the context it wasn't meant. I, I, I wouldn't say she's being misogynistic. Uh, you know, she was trying to make a point about 
uh, keeping immigrant families together <laughs> and went about it in a you know, obnoxious way. Right. Well, look, I mean, I don't expect her to be a good, decent person, nor do I expect her to be fair to Trump. Like, this is a case of, like, she is who you think she is, and um, and that's what people are watching, and that's what people signed up for. And so um, I, you know, there. I guess someone could say that, that I'm being hypocritical or, 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 or that I'm having double standards, that I guess someone could argue that what Samantha B said or did is just as bad as what Roseanne said or did. I don't think so. I mean, they were both offensive. I think racism is rightly in our country um, a, a, a red line, a no go zone because of our history. So maybe that's maybe there is a double standard. So, but, so, so Colin Kaepernick is protesting racism. Yes. On the job in the workplace. OK. Where do you, where do the, you stand on that? Rule, Okay, I don't think anybody should fire him. The new rule, though, is um, you that the NFL says you can either stand for the national anthem or you can stay in. You don't have to come out. You know, you could stay in the locker room and or or else there's going to be a fine. And I think that's a perfect they have every right to impose that that rule. And I would say that's a good rule. Should, should 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 a team sign Colin Kaepernick now? Well, I wouldn't, and the reason I wouldn't though is number one, he's not that good anymore. He used to be very good, um, and number two, so so if you're signing him, there's no expectation that he's going to be good or great. You're you're basically signing somebody to be a second or third string quarterback. He's going to basically be there if somebody gets injured. He's going to like maybe hold snaps and, and hold a clipboard, right? Why would you bring somebody onto your team who is going to be divisive, who is going to maybe anger some of your fan base when there's no upside? So there's a downside to having him, but there's no, he's not going to be a great, he, there's no comeback for him. In my opinion, I think he's like RG three. I don't think that there's, I don't think there's like him having a second act. So I just think from a strategic standpoint, just a business cost benefit analysis, I, I would not bring him on my team for that reason. And you, I assume you would fire Joanne Reed. Well, that's a good question. Am I MSNBC or am I Matt Lewis? You're Matt Lewis. Well, you're, you're Matt Lewis. Who's the president of MSNBC. I don't think I do. She should be fine. I mean, in, in a, in a sane world where, um, in a sane world where people are held to the same standards, okay, if if Matt Lewis, if Matt Lewis had a background identical to Joanne Reed, would Matt Lewis be gainfully employed right now? I don't know the answer to that question. I I, I think not. Um, but if I'm MSNBC. Maybe I just I think I think I just double down on like, hey, this, you know, you know, what are you going to do? Donald Trump does bad stuff and says bad things. And, you know, we're, we're going to, in other words, circle the wagons around your liberal, um, you know, th we live in a world now. And I think Trump has helped reinforce this where like you you don't police your own side. You protect your tribe and you punish your enemies. And so that's what MSNBC is doing. And the same reason that like Fox News probably isn't, wouldn't, well, they have fired people uh, when they, ha subsequently, but but there was a time when I think that was their instinct. But I gotta ask you, Bill Shea, Yes, sir. You cannot put me on the spot <laughs> unless you answer these questions yourself. I'll answer these questions. What, what, do you want, do you want to give me the order? First, let's go to commercial break. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great teaser for us to talk about. Blue Apron, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, yeah, they need free plugs from us. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's go through the list. Google Guy. Um, well, Google Guy and Roseanne are going to put in the same boat. Okay. They did things that made their coworkers feel like, I can't work with this person. They think less of me. If You're, you're, you're saying racist things. You're saying sexist things. I can't be in a functioning workplace mm, Bill, with somebody like that. And so Bill, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, I just, I have to stop you there because 
for me, this isn't a matter of how people feel. People felt like the Google guy, you know, they, they didn't feel comfortable. Well, that, that's, well, as that's a CEO of the company, what Roseanne they, have, did. they have to, what is going to, what's going to allow me to have a functional workplace with good morale? I can't make a political point about, about controversial opinions and have it wreck the ability of my company to function. What if, what if feminists make me feel uncomfortable? Should I not hire any at my at my job because they make me feel? I don't buy that. What Roseanne did is empirically wrong and empirically racist. The Google guy made some people feel uncomfortable. Well, I mean, there are people who say he he was empirically wrong in his points too. Uh, but I I don't see how if, if you have a whole bunch of people, women and men. Uh, who say, but but certainly women are, are going to say, this person thinks less of me and less of my ability in this workplace. How can I collaborate with him? I, okay, so I don't want to like get too much in the weeds on this this dude and his manifesto because it's been a long time. But I think part of what he was saying, as I remember, was for some reason, women aren't haven't been traditionally attracted to this industry and that's just like an empirical fact and you know maybe there's things we can do to change you know to change that like that's different than saying they're not as smart as we are well I, they're I, not I think as he was arguing there, there's some biological hardwiring that makes them less inclined to excel in these fields and not that they can't be exceptions to the rule uh but he was making, is that possible uh, is that po i don't i don't know the answer i'm not going to go into Charles Murray Jordan Peterson territory here, but is that is that possible? I don't know. All I know is I think a lot of women at Google <laughs> took great offense at the argument and felt I can't work with this person. Uh, and Google has to take that into account when saying what when, when you often when you hire somebody are they a good fit for the workplace? How are they going to contribute to office culture? That's part of the equation. Yeah. I also think the way the Google dude wrote that thing was very long, and my recollection is he sort of went to great pains to couch it and all sorts of like, you know, ironic rhetoric. Whereas what Roseanne did is a very blatant tweet that there was no attempt. She wasn't trying to make an intellectual like, hey, maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is an interesting point. We should con no. See, I, it's very I, I, different. I think Day Moore did his thing in the most dickish, pedantic, condescending way possible. Where I look at all the research I did, I'm obviously right, and how can you not see it my way? And I'm going to put this on the on the internal list serve, and you're gonna and you're gonna have to bow down to my my perfect logic. You know what? You know how you handle a guy like that. You just ignore him. Who cares? Here's what he thinks. He's probably a nerd. He's a weirdo. He's got way too much time on his hands. Uh, I don't know if has he ever kissed a girl. I don't know. <laughs> um, he like just ignore that guy. Like you don't need to like. Just, who who the hell was he? He's not Roseanne Barr. He doesn't have millions of followers. He doesn't have a TV show. He's some guy who works at Google, who worked at Google that they decided to destroy. Well, to shift shift this to Roseanne. I think part of the Roseanne issue is. I mean, plenty of people might say offensive, obnoxious things uh, at random points in time, be uh, confronted, apologize, change their behavior, and you move on. But since with Roseanne, this is a pattern of behavior, it's right. not new. And people in her workplace were beginning to say, I can't work here. No, uh, is that true? Is well, that well, true? Wanda Sykes did. I mean, maybe she wasn't integral to the show because she was a, okay. like, more of a consultant. Okay. But but she said, I will no longer work on this show. I think ABC could, I mean, I, I can't get in the heads of their individual executives, but it would be logical to be like, Wanda's not going to be the last one to walk out on this show. And I'm not going to be able to attract good talent on the show with Roseanne as the, as the center. Um, right. Because otherwise, you might say, look. We, we we don't stop watching Seinfeld after Michael Richards because yeah. he went through his walk of shame, and you think, okay, maybe this guy you know learned something from this from this process. With Roseanne, uh, I don't think she was uh, she wasn't given that leeway because it's been going on for so long, and 
And I think the people on the show might have thought, okay, maybe she's pulling herself together. Obviously, she's yeah. not. And by the way, cheap self uh, self promotional thing. Uh, I wrote about I wrote about Roseanne in 2016 about how Roseanne. This is before the Roseanne reboot. Uh, about how Roseanne paved the way for Trump. So check that out. Okay, so, Bill. So you have more to answer. Right. So Joanne Reed. So I think, I, well, I'll give the Joanne, but just Sam B. I think we're on the same page there. Um, we should but apologize you, or not. This was sort of part and parcel of the kind of show she does. Uh, and her people aren't going to walk out of the show. Her workers are going to walk out of the show. Her fans are going to walk out of the show. There's no obvious reason to fire her. Um, Joanne Reed. Uh, what's interesting about Joanne Reed is that uh, let, let's let's go on the perception that she's lying. Maybe I there's think something. Most, what's that? I mean, I think most people who've looked into this have come to the conclusion that she's lying. Okay, so let's. let's but just, I want to get you know. Let's I, not I even debate that. Let's just let's just say for the sake of argument that she's lying. Okay, uh, she's lying about things she did ten plus years ago that are personally embarrassing and conflict with the kind of journalist and pundit she is being today. Uh, she is not actively today on MSNBC doing things that are homophobic uh, and um, uh, otherwise offensive. Uh, it is somewhat akin to Brian Williams. Brian Williams didn't say false things on the news. He said false things about his role uh, in life. He was embellishing his own his own image. Uh, he got suspended, but is now back on the air in a somewhat diminished capacity. But I've actually listened to somewhat his, diminished. What's that? Somewhat diminished, a majorly diminished. But capacity. you know, he he's doing a show on MSNBC every night, at eleven o'clock, and I actually just started listening to it recently. It's a pretty good show. No, sure, uh, he's, I mean, he's good. I mean, he's good at what he does. Right, he's good at what he does. Uh, so I don't think if MS, if MSNBC or MSNBC News wants to say we can't have liars on our network because it hurts our credibility, that would be a perfectly legitimate thing for them to do. Uh, but I think it's also le legitimate to say, you know what, um, you're not lying on air, you're not oh, lying gosh. in the workplace. What if, what if someone found out that? What if someone found out that? Um, I'm trying to think of a good an analogy. Uh, you know, a conservative pundit plagiarized ten years ago, or um, or was a part of a an anti-Semitic racist group ten years ago. Um, you know, is, is is in other words, like, are we are we basically saying like your your past doesn't matter? You sexually harassed ten years ago. That's okay. Well, I, you're I, an anti I, I ten years ago. That's okay. Because past... now, because now you're okay. Now, in your capacity, now you're you're fine. I, I think if you learn from past mistakes, then but yeah. doesn't that mean admitting them? How can you, if you are not admitting that you did something, how could you have learned from it? Like, don't you have to like? Well, I did Joy, this. Well, Joanne Reed did do some admitting. She didn't admit to everything, but she had her she had her on air mea culpa. Where she kind of half admitted uh, and said that she's grown and learned since then. Uh, it's sort of bound up with this kind of crazy. I my psych on hack. You know story. what it reminded me of, Bill? I hate to say this because you know I love I love me some Ronald Reagan, <laughs> but it reminded me of during Iran Contra. Reagan goes on TV and he's like, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, I still believe that we did not trade arms hostage. <laughs> right, right. But the facts seem to indicate that we did. <laughs> it's like, that's basically what she was like. I still, in my heart of hearts, don't think I wrote anything that was racist or homophobic, but the records seem to indicate that I did. It was like... And, you know, and, and if she didn't do that, if she has owned it all from the get-go, said, I did this, uh, I'm embarrassed by it, I can't believe I used to think this way, I've grown so much th since then... I understand if you can't forgive me for what I did, but I just want you to know that I think you've seen on this show that I don't think this way anymore. You wouldn't have this drip, drip, drip issue. 
I mean, people are treating yeah. every drip from you know web.archive.org uh, as if it's a new revelation when it's all part and parcel of the same story. She wrote horrible things on her blog over ten years ago. Uh, yeah. If she just and owned it off at the get go, we wouldn't be having this. I would say again, I do think it's possible that someone could be hacked, and I do think it's possible that. I've stumbled across things I wrote. I have no recollection of writing them. And, and they're not bad, but it's actually me. I'm not saying someone else did it. Things that I wrote, because I, when I worked at The Daily Caller, or like when I worked at townhall.com, I would blog five times a day, every day. I mean, they weren't all long. Some of them were very short. Or they, today, there'd be a tweet. But like over the last 10 years, I must have written, I don't know, do the math, but like thousands and thousands of things on the internet and sometimes i'll run across like an article or something i wrote like, i'll have like very like no recollection of having written it so like i actually believe i think a lot of people out there might not believe that she could forget some of the things that she wrote but is it actually possible that you might forget some of the things that you did in the past or wrote in the past especially uh, if you're drunk or writing <laughs> before we wrap up <laughs> i do want to talk a little bit about the upcoming primaries on tuesday uh, it's a big primary now, this day. This is now where we segue into the non-sexy, non-salacious <laughs> uh, part of the show. So, um, spoiler alert. So, the big the big game is California, where you got a ton of house races. They have this weird top two set up where everyone's on the ballot at the same time, Republican, Democrat, whoever. And whoever is the top two finishers, regardless of party, move on to November. And I think this, this whole race is proving... How ridiculous the system is! I think this is a Schwarzenegger special that was meant to, you know, bring us more to the middle, so the base we don't play to our bases in the primaries. But I think the exact opposite is happening. You can still get in the top two by playing to the base and getting into getting a niche vote, but and at the same time you can totally screw one party so they don't even get into the general election, even if the the general bend of the district goes in the opposite direction. So it's a horrible system, but. It may hurt Democrats on the House side. It may hurt Republicans in the governor's race. Uh, so we have, to, we have to watch for that. We also have Mississippi, Alabama, Iowa, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, and South Dakota. So there's, I, I can't go into all those races uh, there. One other California race that I think is really interesting, even though it might not be of, of national import, uh, it's only of import to the extent you care about ranked choice voting and how ranked choice voting works in practice. Because uh, there is a there is a move to um, have more states adopt that model. Um, and the argument being it, it, it throws away the whole concept of a wasted vote. You could vote for someone who isn't seen to be a front runner, knowing that your second place choice vote will then count if your first place choice doesn't make it make make the cut. Um, so at San Francisco, they, you, you, you do your top three. Uh, and, and you can rank them. You get th you know, three points for your first place, two points for your second place, one point for your first, third place, essentially. Um, so in San Francisco, in the mayor's race, the mayor died. Ed Lee died unexpectedly. So this is a special election to fill out the term. When the mayor dies, the head of the Board of Supervisors, which is their city council, becomes interim mayor. And that was Lyndon Breed, who incidentally is the first African-American woman to be mayor of San Francisco. But while a Democrat, she is seen as close to the, the tech industry in, in Silicon Valley, uh, and therefore she is not beloved by a lot of progressives in San Francisco. So the Board of Supervisors votes to oust her from being mayor <laughs> uh, and install a caretaker mayor who, by the way, is a high-tech millionaire. <laughs> but he's not running for the office, so the, the main point was to get London Bree out of there so she doesn't have a leg up in the special election. One of the people that voted for that was Jane Kim, who is also running for mayor to London Bree's left. Uh, they're also uh, in the race. I mean, it's a big field. But uh, also a top uh, contender is Mark Leno, who is a former state senator, uh, also running more on the left. Kim and Leno have a joint ad where they say, you know, I'm James Kim, and I'm voting for Mark Leno. I'm Mark Leno, and I'm voting for Jane Kim. Uh, we think this race should be decided by the people and not the billionaires. Uh, so they don't say London Breed's name. 
but the clear implication is let's box London Breed out of the seat so one of us can get it. Because uh, in the polling, Breed's first, but not by a huge amount, and Kim and Leno are second. So Ooh. they can make sure that Kim and Leno supporters don't vote for London Breed as a second place choice. Uh, or maybe leave the rest of their ballot blank and only vote for one of them, Breed might get on the strength of first place and second place votes. This is mayor? This is mayor, yes. And is it like, the, the so the current mayor is the first African-American woman? Or well, the first it, woman? It, it was briefly <laughs> okay. the first African-American woman, but she got ousted in a vote by the Board of Supervisors. She's no longer mayor. It's some And the problem is now. she some was too conservative, right? She's not... She's not liberal enough, or she's too conservative, or what was the? She's too 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 corporate. Uh, okay, too in the corporate. eyes of some progressives in San Francisco. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's not a, uni- a, a uniform opinion. And there's certainly plenty of people that say we want to have the first African American woman. She's she's certainly liberal enough for San Francisco. Uh, so uh, so and we should know relatively quickly because so much of California voting is by mail. You might see the you might see all those votes come in as soon as the polls close. Uh, I mean, it's it's Pacific time, so I think it polls close me eleven o'clock Eastern time. Uh, but it may not run that late into the evening because so many votes are going to be counted instantaneously. Well, that's why we tune into the DMZ, Bill. <laughs> For this kind of you just dropped a whole bunch of knowledge on us, and I I'll do sound my best. smart. I'll sound smart at the water cooler when I'm talking about. London Breed, what's the name? London, London Breed is the is the woman who got ousted, and so and I could talk about that, and I could talk about Buck Owens, <laughs> and I could, and Google Guy. <laughs> well, so next week will be post primary, so we can dissect all those result, yeah. results. And what do, what do you got to plug this week, Matt? Oh man, uh, Matt Lewis and News podcast is is trucking along. Uh, Senator Mike Lee and John Podhoritz were on this week. Next week, I believe I've got Ben Shapiro and David Axelrod. Wow! And uh, in, in the Hopper, whatever a Hopper is, uh, for next week. So uh, well, Matt Lewis in the news on iTunes, man. If you like your podcast without high flying celebrities on them, uh, <laughs> you can listen to my New Books and Politics podcast, the New Books Network. This week we have what? David Farris, the author of "It's Time to Fight Dirty," which is a manifesto for Democrats to uh, fight Bill. Republicans harder. Uh, Bill. This is an evil theory. This guy, unless I think I've got the right guy, he thinks instead of returning to norms and civility, that Democrats should like stack the courts yep. Yep. and um and break into like California to like seven states. Yep, that's right. It's essentially if you've read how democracies die, he wants to follow the playbook. No, he's, he, to, we to, talked about that on the show. He wants to kill democracies. He talked about it on the show. He, he, he basically thinks that the, the how democracies die theory of the world and all the books coming out there saying our norms are being eroded. He's basically saying, screw that. Who cares? Republicans have shown you can break these norms and not be punished. And Democrats should do the same thing. So, so I'm not hard. saying it's where I'm at, but you should, if you want to hear his argument, listen Ugh. to the podcast. Uh, and uh, next week, uh, I wrote this in, in the can, uh, David Nywart, who's been a longtime chronicler of far-right extremism, has a book called Alt-America. Uh, I mean, he's actually talked to people in the militia movements and, and, and things like that. Huh. Um, so he has a lot of insight on the whole history of uh, uh, that, uh, that, that political pool and how they've uh, risen to uh, help elect the president today. So that should be coming out in a few days. Let me just say, I'm biased, but what you just described, what I just described... And rhin- cocaine and rhinestone. Um, <laughs> that will keep you busy for the week. And frankly, there's nothing better out there. Like this is amazing. This is like quality stuff. So man, check it out. And you, and you, if you hate David Ferris, you're gonna want to hear what he has to say and you know absorb it, think about it, process it. I don't want to support him, so I'm not gonna buy the book. But I will support you yes. by rating and reviewing the podcast on iTunes. Uh, going to Patreon. And uh, putting a buck or two in the tip jar there. Just give me your money and give me your stars. That's all. Yeah, that you've got it, my friend. All right, uh, follow us on Twitter at DMZ Show, and uh, we'll see you back here next week. All right, take care.